Michael Madgett live from Hollywood, California. With me, uh, with a little bit of a sore throat, is 99 World Cup winner Suskia Weber. Suskia, did you uh, did you have a good weekend uh, in the 120 Appar- degrees? Apparently, I had a good weekend in Ball Springs. <laughs> Too good of a weekend. I don't have a voice. And it was like four of us, so that should tell you that. Uh, that's true. How hot did it actually get there? 120. 120 degrees. Wow. That is a... But it's a dry heat. Oh, there you go. <laughs> it hurts. It's still hot. Exactly. Thank you, Bella. Like, oh. the, the pool was amazing, and then towards the middle of the day, it just kind of started feeling like, you know, a jacuzzi. You know where it doesn't get 120 degrees? The Pacific Northwest. I don't think and, it does. <laughs> yes. And that, and that is a segue into our guest today, guys. Uh, you might remember her from her breakout performances in the NWSL Challenge Cup this year. Portland Thorns goalkeeper Bella Bigsby is joining us today. What is up, Bella? How are you? I'm great. How are you? <laughs> Good. You guys are, you guys are back, right? Yeah, we're all back. I mean, so we're all back, but kind of trickling into market right now. Sweet. Yeah. How's the uh, how, how's the how's the health going? How's it uh, how's recovering? Uh, about three and a half weeks post op. Um, you know, kind of turned a corner. First week's rough. I had no idea what I was in in for. Um, but yeah, kind of turned that corner, and I've started rehab, and you know, just baby steps here and there. A lot to go, but it's part of the process. Yeah, I will tell you, take it slow. Yeah, and I know I know how hard that is from like our mentality and everything, but, um, slow and steady, you know, don't force it when you come back hundred percent. Yeah. I, I think we're all kind of med- medical staff wise all on the same page is that there's yeah. really no reason to rush this and just do it right and get it strong. So you know, play yeah. play. I mean, I mean, I mean, you've got an, I mean, you've got such a future ahead of you. Like there's like no reason to rush anything whatsoever. Like we want to see you playing for years and years and years and years Absolutely. and years to come. Yeah. Keep I, that longevity I, in mind. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I mean, my gosh, I mean, like, it's like even, even like didn't, didn't Nadine, like, uh, didn't she dress, uh, during the tournament and, uh, she was, uh, she was ready to hop, hop in if it, if it called for. I don't yeah. think we had a choice. We were, I mean, yeah, I, <laughs> I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's, she was ready to go. I think I uh, I had left by then. I was in Portland, um, but yep, there she was. She was on the ro- on the roster. <laughs> that's fa- that's that's fabulous. So, so unfortunately, Saskia can't t- can't uh, can't do that for UCLA. She can't just uh, hop in there, put on the gloves. No, I think that might be an NCAA <laughs> restriction, right? Yeah, there. I know, just a little bit. I think my eligibility was up twenty years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty well, sure. <laughs> so. Well, speaking of eligibility, uh, Bella, a lot of people, you know, in who you know who are insiders, you know, who are fans right here, you know, might not be familiar with you. Obviously, you kind of kind of broke onto into the scene during the Challenge Cup. A lot of people weren't familiar with your game. Um, obviously, you know, you played at Oregon State, and then over you went over overseas. And this is something that Saskia had really stressed to a lot of people is to kind of expand their opportunities and look at other playing opportunities and other training opportunities. Um, so kind of, why don't you tell us a little bit about your time um, at, at Frankfurt, obviously now it's Eintracht Frankfurt, but at the time FSC Frankfurt and, uh, and what you kind of learned there. Yeah. Um, so I've obviously had two different opportunities playing overseas, both kind of happened last minute. It felt like um, FFC, my opportunity at FFC happened very last minute within finding out about the opportunity and then getting on a flight um, was about six days. Um, but it was, it was great. Obviously, um, you know, that was after my, the year that I was drafted, I wouldn't, I didn't sign. So it wasn't my rookie year technically, but had been training with the team all year. And, um, as you said, I played at Oregon state and then I grew up in, in Oregon and, uh, hadn't really left much. Um, so it was a really good opportunity for me to really grow in that aspect outside of soccer. And then absolutely playing on a team, um, with different tactics and um, different players is always good for athletes to grow. And I felt like I grew a lot. Um, unfortunately, got injured and had to come back early. I was also getting married, so I was coming back early anyway, but um, had kind of an unlucky injury while I was there and, and decided it was the best to come back. But I felt like I <laughs> made a lot of good, um, a lot of good growth there um, on and off the field. And um, yeah, I would recommend anyone to, if, if, if they're playing professionally and coming out of college to try to, um, broaden those horizons and get out of your comfort zone. 
Yeah, absolutely. And like I've, I've, I've been an advocate of that, you know, um, yeah. it's learning other styles, learning other systems, playing with players that you might not ever see or, uh, and against players that if you'd only see if you were on the national team. Um, and so it's, it just grows your game period. Yeah. yeah now, it, was, now, it was the greatest decision I made. So. I mean, I, I want to ask this to you, Bella. Um, how has your German gotten since, since your time there? Like, do you ever speak <laughs> German with Nadine, for instance? Um, I understand very little of what she says. Sometimes I'll throw out like one word sentences is kind of where, yeah, one word sentences is kind of what I'm, I'm limited to. And they're usually only in scope of soccer. <laughs> I understand, understand like flunk and just crosses left and right counting. Um, yeah. And certain other words, but. Like other, such a short amount of time. Um, it was fun. Were you? Because when when we do film review, she's yeah. got all of her folders on her on her on her desktop on her laptop, and it's all in German. And I was trying to, uh, try to figure out what they say because she's got her feedback. She doesn't want us to know what it says in so, see it. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> so so it's almost kind you know of like, you know like reading code. Yeah, but you know what I'll yeah. tell you? What's funny is like for me in Japan, it taught me even better to. My direction was so precise and short and to the point because I only knew certain words. So it was like, right, push your right, push your left, clear, this, that, and the other. Yeah. So there wasn't a lot of like random talk in between. Not that I was a random talker. I am now, but I'm not that I was then. And um, it was, it kept it short, sweet, to the point. <laughs> yeah, I'd agree with that. <laughs> yeah. Let's get, I, can't, I can't imagine you being the quiet type on the field whatsoever. I can't in see Japan, that happening. I didn't I, I spoke English. It's like backwards, you know, English. It's, it, was, it was a debacle. But I did fine. I was there for three years. But yeah, German, forget it. Bella was <laughs> like, hard language. It's a little, but it's a little more intense. <laughs> like in, in, in Japan, I'd be like, thank you, clear the ball, like bowing. Like in German, it's like, I'm sure it's like pretty more direct and hardcore. It's a little more blunt to the point. Yeah. <laughs> if you can imagine. Oh. Yeah, were well, you there I'm with Dutch? It's a little softer, but <laughs> yeah. Bella, were you there with Bree? I was. Okay. Yeah. So, how, what was that experience like having another American there? That I, I would think that that would be was at, at least easier. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, she would. Uh, we would go to get um, falafel like once a week. We had a kind of little American girl dates um, where we'd go just hang out and um, go into the city a little bit. And uh, no, it was great because. Um, Anytime you're on a new team internationally, there's always the um, complication of maybe a language barrier or, um, you know, just subtle differences in technique or uh, agendas and training. So to have a fellow goalkeeper who's American, super helpful, especially just for the first time, me stepping outside my comfort zone that way. I felt like um, she, f it, was, it was really nice having her um, as a training companion. Um, She's competitive, so we pushed each other, and I thought it was really great to to train with her. Yeah, yeah no, I mean, you don't understand those little American dates, girl dates are this imperative. Yeah, I mean, like it was my. <laughs> thing, I felt like I, I look back on my <clears throat> in Germany, and I know it was only will be three years ago this or two years ago this um, this winter, but I felt like it was a different world in terms of my mindset and where I was at mentally and as a player. Yeah. Um. So f to have that kind of outlet yeah. <laughs> was um great yeah because we used to it was me tammy Pierman. you guys are too you're too young to know these people me tammy Pierman, um kim smith and stuff and then we had tiffany melbert was there shannon mcmillan and stuff like that but we would meet because i was close enough we would meet on the weekends after games in tokyo and just like it, in the Rapongi, which is the um, american district yeah. and we would all meet and see everybody and hang out and just like have that touch with home and stuff yeah. and then um, it was important yeah it was hard I mean I lived I lived alone um so having that was I don't know I, I it helps me balance out the new yeah. with some comfortability yeah and it must have been nice to have some Americans around because like when I went overseas I was the only American uh in the in the academy that I joined and they were all like why are you here they're like they're like <laughs> 
I mean, it was a little oh, bit of a American. different situation. A little bit is of this, different situation. Is this Venezuela situation. we're talking about? Yeah, this is Venezuela. So <laughs> things were a little bit different economically, uh, sociopolitically and everything like that. So they were like, yeah, they're like, we kind of want to come there. Like, how do you do that? Why, why are you here? What is this, what is this all about for you? <laughs> like, I came for the food. The food is amazing. Um, speaking about, uh, s- s- this is the worst segue ever in the history of the world, but let's see if I can make this happen here. Um, <laughs> speaking big, big bucks, come of... On. Speaking of translation, speaking of translation, oh, I just got a really? text message from Saskia. Speaking of translation, we're going to go into today's topic, okay? And that I told is. Him to stop scratching his face. Do I have? I do have. I know I have no, these but you keep scratching going. your face. Is that what it's coming from? Yeah, stop scratching. Oh my, oh my gosh, Bella, can you see it? Are there scratches? Where are the scratches? I think it's it like a cat attack. Stop, attacking? just go. Do All your right. transition. All right, here's our transition. Here we're gonna, this edit's going to be amazing. Um, <laughs> speaking of translations, we're going to be talking about today's topic, which is recognizing triggers, which is kind of like translating what the other players are doing and anticipating their movements. Um, for some of the parents out there and maybe, you know, some of the younger goalkeeper coaches who might not be familiar with what we're talking about, uh, Bella, kind of in your words, what is a trigger? Um, for me, a trigger would be anything that you – um, recognize within the run of play that's going to prompt you to act, um, whether that's changing your position or um, a trigger is information um, and you do with, what, with that information what you've been trained to do. Um, so, you know, every goalkeeper may react to a trigger a little bit differently, but I think when it comes down to it, a trigger is something that prompts you to act in a game. Yeah, no, I, I think uh, I think you you've really succinctly made that right there. And I think one of the problems that I think happens a lot of times with with younger goalkeepers is they try to read too much into a situation rather than just look kind of for the simple. Um, Saskia, I know that's something that you talk about consistently. Is like you know, just keep it focused, keep it simple. Don't try to overanalyze what's going on in front of you. Yeah, and don't try to assume. You know how I hate that. You know, don't try to be ahead of the play. Um, you can read the situation and understand the game that's going on in front of you and what what the most the the most the right play for for anybody coming at you would be to but that's it's not it's a gray area you never know so you have to be able to react you have to be able to be in the right position but then kind of it's a quick decision you have to be cognizant enough to make that choice really quick when the situation that you're assuming in front of you which you know or reading in front of you, I should say, not assuming, um, changes. And that trigger um, makes you have to make another really quick choice on the fly. I'm really glad that you brought, brought up quick because that's, that's something that's so, so, so <clears throat> integral is how quick you have to make these decisions and how, how quickly you have to read this stuff, Bella. And, and honestly, one of the reasons we wanted to have you on for this topic is because you are so good and, and we're going to break down some of your plays that, that are just big time from the, from the cup uh, in this episode today. And she's like, oh, gosh, I can't believe you're doing that. Um, <laughs> but you recognize these movements, these slight little movements so quickly, and you make a good decision based on it. So, so can you kind of, like, kind of basically kind of reemphasize how important it is that you just like, you identify it quickly and then you make the decision as opposed to kind of waffling? Yeah, I think um... – Every goalkeeper at some point in their career gets caught anticipating or trying to assume um, what's going to happen next. And that's, you don't want that to happen, obviously. Um, you might get lucky and go the right way or um, you may. One time out of 10. One time out of 10. And it's going to reinforce that you should be guessing. Um, <laughs> um, but I think, yeah, reading triggers is useless if you're not, it's, if, if what comes next isn't correct. Um, so, I think keeping it simple is really a key for reading triggers. Um, not getting overwhelmed by the, the mass of information in front of you um, because there's obviously a lot going on during something like a counterattack or a quick slip pass or things like that. So not getting overwhelmed, but um, certainly at, at, at Portland, we have a culture within our goalkeepers um, to just keep things simple. Mm-hmm. Um, we actually worked on kind of a, sort of like flow chart at the beginning of the season in terms of like being presented with a trigger. Um, how do you make your decisions for what's next? Because there's obviously technical executions based on a trigger or tactical, mm-hmm. your set position and coming out versus staying, what kind of goalkeeper you are. Um, so I think also just learning what kind of style you have as a, as a goalkeeper because 
um, you know, me and another goalkeeper are going to have maybe two different reactions to a trigger in terms of dropping maybe on our line or coming out to collect a 1v1. Depends on our strengths, depends on our weaknesses. And um, there are obviously instances where every goalkeeper should be making maybe one decision based on a trigger, but um, I think keeping it simple is going to be key for reading triggers. Yeah, but you're 100% right. And we've talked about that. Like your strengths did like also dictate that. So if your explosiveness off the line for a 50-50 ball is different than another goalkeeper's, they're going to they're gonna react differently to that trigger. And right. it's understanding your strengths, absolutely. And I, like, I love what you said about not getting overwhelmed about all the information in front of you. And we see a lot, that a lot with young goalkeepers where, like, you know how I feel about young goalkeepers. They're so literal. You know, like, it's like, oh, my God. Yep. Go um, left, go left. They run off the field. They, they run off the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're, do we're doing this. Oh, they, do like, oh, my God. Yeah. Like, make a decision. Even, like, I'm not perfect shooting the ball or nobody is. Like, oh, my God. Go with it. Uh, yeah. So, and it, it, it's actually recognizing that and learning to recognize that. Like, don't be so literal and don't, you know. But that information in front of you, it's also filtering it out. And we get this with young goalkeepers when you're coaching. You know, we're talking. Let's say we're talking about communication and organization. When you know you're, there's a counterattack coming at you, and I'll be like going over that, and my kids will be like organizing the weak side because I told them to organize the weak side, and the ball's like entering the 18, and I'm like, dude, you were supposed to organize the weak side, and that's the end of it. <laughs> like, like now focus on the ball. You know, so it's it's not getting overwhelmed and caught up in that stuff, and you know, just it's really reading the game. Yeah. And I think you just brought up go ahead. the game, you have to see re reps and reps and reps. You can't just see it's it every repetition. week and hope to get better at reading when you're going to come or when you're going to go for a 1v1. You got to see it, tons of 1v1s to be able to make your decisions. And because everything's different, yeah. always. Yeah, I, I, you know, I, I'm glad you just brought that up in regards to having to see those repetitions, those repetitions, those repetitions. By the way, I'm just picturing this poor, this poor, no, I'm just picturing this poor goalkeeper who like Husky has said like, organize the weak side. And this goalkeeper's just like focused on organizing the weak side. The ball's like, like over he's like, here. He's like, he's like over here talking to the weak side and the ball's in the back of the net. And I'm just like, oh my God, not no, so literal. Like when you're like checking your shoulder and then <laughs> looking across is right there. Like, ah. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. <laughs> So, oh yeah. Um, How do you and then you're just like, all right, I could listen to me and organize a weak side, but now we have to understand when, how, why to do it. Yeah, I think understanding the why is a big one for taking the next step and applying it to a new scenario is like yeah. you're not just doing it to do it. Don't take it literally. You just gotta understand when and when and why you're doing that. Why it's important. Yeah. I mean, you brought up a really good point in regards, regards to the why. And I think one of the issues, Bella and, and Saskia, and I don't know how, how you feel about this too. I, I think you're on the same page as us is that the problem is a lot of goalkeeper coaches are doing the same pattern scenarios over and over again in training sessions. And then goalkeepers, they start anticipating those plays in games, yeah. but then they can't deal with the unexpected. Um, I'll give a perfect example. And then maybe we'll watch it in a second. Is that Lynn Williams play where the ball deflected? I think it was a, the pass from Dabinia to Lynn Williams or something like that, right? And then she hit the shot. The ball had, had a rebound, and then you had to recover because the ball was bending to the back post. But because of the deflection, then it started veering near post, and you had to react, and you had to make that movement across like that, you know? Um, so how important is it to do multiple, multiple, and just different types of scenarios over and over again and change it up for the goalkeeper so they're not familiar with it, Bella? Well, for me, I would tell you, for me, like if you're, if we're doing something and let's say we're doing a through ball into a certain position and everything like that, and you're, and we're doing repetition after repetition and you start cheating and leaning and anticipating, I'm going to slot the ball near post on you. Yeah, absolutely. I'm um, going to be like, why don't you pick that out in the net and stop leaning to your left? Yeah. You know, well, that's a big, that's a big component of our training um, <laughs> in our group. It's, Hey, if I'm cheating, punish mm -hmm. me for it. Like, absolutely. Um, and, and I tell the forward try that. to make each other look like idiots. <laughs> um, but no, also but it's true. Within training, um, we obviously do you know a nice warm up, work on, on on technical executions. But as soon as we get more into the complex movements, um, if you were to watch one of our trainings, we don't have cookie cutter. You know, every rep's going to be the same. We right. integrate as much no looking as possible. We integrate as much multi option. You know, like someone's on the ball, maybe presenting um a shot but they pass to someone wide like yeah. 
we're not, we don't do a lot of ABC drills. This is, that's part of the warm up. And then towards the end of the goalkeeper session, it's, it's kind of a free for all. It's like structured, but there's maybe three, four, five things that can happen. And that's what's really gotten us um, as a group good at reading triggers and being patient is like really at, towards the end of training, we're doing a, a structured practice, but like anything can happen and you need to be able to read that. Um, because a lot with, a lot of times with kids, um, it's easier just to kind of get, you know, you want to get them the technical um, aspects of the game nice and clean, but it's easy to get kind of wrapped up in doing the same drill over and over again. And you're right, they either anticipate and they start leaning yeah. or they're just, they kind of hit their ceiling in, in, in that day of not, they're not having to anticipate, they're not having to. And they're not reading. Or it's just, I know it's coming to my right, I'll dive yeah. in there. Instead of maybe you're leaning and she opens up her hips, you got to get squared up again. So yeah, I mean, the game's not predictable. I don't think training should be either. I, 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 you bring up a really good point because there's a, there's a lot of times, like I'll see, like even a high level ECNL goalkeeper and I'll watch them in a warm up, and I'm just like clean hands, like great movement and stuff like that. I'm like, oh no, they just memorized the warm up. Yeah. They literally don't know how to read the game once they get into the game and the messiness of the game. They just know how to go through these patterns right here, you know? And, and I think, I think there's something that we really need to bring up in, in regards to that too, Bella. And that is that the, like, there's a difference between guessing, leaning, anticipating, and, you know, and having an educated idea of where the direction of the play is going. Right. Sure. Yeah. I think that that's a fair distinction. I think that um, you can, you can read what's in front of you and have a pretty good idea of maybe what's going to unfold, but you can't let your body give it away. You, you have to be balanced at all times. You can't, you know, maybe if because of the defender's formation, the, the forward only has the far post open. You can anticipate that, but there might be a deflection. You need to be balanced and ready yeah. for that. I was you just going to say You can't that. take your step early because you know all she's got is a bender to the back post because it could go right through your defender's leg to the near post. You got to be balanced yeah. as long as possible. Even if you have an idea of what's going on, you may be more prepared for that bender back post. But you need to be ready for anything mm -hmm. that could happen because the game's unpredictable. Yeah. How Not a Portland Thorns defender. How many times does your defender lunge and it goes through their legs right at you? Or, you or it deflects a little bit and then you're, looking at, and yeah. you're looking at it go by your feet because you already are going right. to the post. So I think Absolutely. having an educated guess mm -hmm. is one thing. And I think we talk about it a lot with, you know, especially reading your defender's position in relation to what is being given um, in terms of the goal. But yeah, I think being balanced and patient as long as possible is uh, key. And we tell, like, and I tell my goalkeepers, and we tell goalkeepers, like, this is, I was just explaining this to somebody this weekend, but it's, it's chess. Like, we are positioning, and hopefully they're listening, our defenders to make the simplest save, to, to make the smallest angle for the shooter and everything, whether it's push or right, push or left, step, whatever it is. So you're manipulating the situation, but you can't you can't over assume that it's going to be perfect. You can't say, okay, you know, so-and-so is pushing her right. She's pushing her right. She only has this much. She's going to slide it here. That's it. And so I am going to lean. I'm going to get a jump on this. Like you said, because there's, a, it's never perfect. It's a gray area. It's a deflection. It's this, it's that, it's the other, you know, your, your, your defender doesn't do what you said. Next thing you know, she cuts it back and your, you know, your weight's the wrong direction. Yeah. So I'll always be balanced, you know, yeah. but reading the game. I think a big topic we touched on last year as a goalkeeper group was, you know, if you're being presented, it's a snapshot right before the shot comes off their foot. And there's some information in front of you that's telling you that some part of the goal is open. Maybe it's, and it's a harder part of the goal to, to score on for whatever reason. You need to be able to save what you're, what you need to save. In those tough situations, maybe they're only five yards out of, off the goal line and it's crowded and things are happening. Too many times goalkeepers will anticipate lean and it ends up going right past them. And I'm mm -hmm. definitely guilty of it in training. Um, save what you should be saving. Make the yeah. forward have to make that hard, that hard shot that's, you know, a harder goal. Save what you, I mean, at the end of the day. Save what you can save. Out of the save net, keep it simple. Yeah. Like your job is to save what's in your bubble. It's to save what you can save. If you're going to put the ball, if you're going to rip a shot into my upper 90 that nobody's going to be able to save, I'm not upset about that. Like I'm probably, I've gotten up and clapped before, like nice shot, you know, after ripping my defender and a new one probably. But Wait, um, you got up and clapped? I've clapped before. You played against me all the way back in the day. <laughs> you would have clapped too. Um, so, so, or Germany. So, um, yeah, but. Save what, and then that's part of keeping it simple. Yeah. Like, 
your job isn't to be this like, you know, like circus act that's flying all over the place, making these crazy saves. It's, it's to keep it simple, to keep it organized. I've always said the greatest save a goalkeeper can make is no save at all for organization. And second of all is the easiest save possible. Stay on your feet, hold on to the ball, don't give up a rebound, you know? But that, you know, that's how you want to look at it. Save what you can save. Can we, uh, can we pull up, uh, uh, one, on, uh, okay, honestly, Bella, this is one of my favorite saves, maybe, like, honestly, in a while. Like, I really love this save. I think we've gone over it over, like, four times on the show. I'm going to pull up the Sanchez to hatch. <laughs> I'm sorry. I just, I love this play. I Let have to pull it up. up. And I, I, I want to get your feedback on it. Whoops, that's not, that's not it right there. Um, all right, now, now I think I can open it up here. We're fancy here. Okay. Fancy. All right. Fancy. Okay, so no, that's obviously the Yokoyama save. So it's coming up here. Here it is. All right, Sanchez. Ashley. Two hatch. Set. Look at your set position right there. And notice how she's not leaning that direction already. She's in a nice, st solid, stable position right there, as I don't have to tell her. And then as that shot's hit, she starts recognizing that trigger of how that ball's I love how moving. You, uh, and that follow through is absolutely world class, in my opinion, Bella. Right there. And I mean, Bella, you'll I, love you, you'll love this. We had Michelle Akers on, um, at analyzing for from a forward perspective because she's like Saskia. I'm coming on the show to like school you goalkeepers. And her t her mentality on this was so number one. Like she should have cut it inside because she would have been taken out and it would have been a PK. Um, but but we were like, and Michelle said she goes, "This is Ooh. what's so great about this is that Michelle hated." was you came and you stood her up. So now she has to make that decision. Um, instead of like a lot of goalkeepers Boom. will come and they'll be like, oh, maybe I can beat her that ball and I'm going to go down on a 50-50. And, you know, she knows, you know, you're beat. Um, but to recognize, okay, you're not going to get to that ball and then stand her up big. And Michelle said she hated when that, Look at that. when that would happen because now she has to, now she's like, crap, what do I do? You know, and um, no, it was solid. You know, you were you were balanced, and you know, where's she gonna put it? I mean, yeah. it was absolutely so brilliant, brilliant to me because also also the steer too. A lot of goalkeepers in that situation they just react and then they just make make a play on the ball. But you actually made a, a conscious decision of where you were going to steer that ball, and you followed through, which is something that we talk about with our, our, our young goalkeepers all the time. Is they have to be following through, nose and chin keeps the eyes on the ball and follows all the way through the play. And then even your recovery movement, you're up and you're ready in case anything happened. So See, I, anytime I, you want to awesome. feel in a good mood, just come on the show. We'll just, <laughs> we'll just fluff you up. <laughs> I, I've changed my I'm, And I was like, you're like, Oh, I've heard Sasuke's like a bitch. I do like, <laughs> <laughs> like in that moment was like, obviously next play, it's a corner, whatever. But after the game, me and Nadine both were like, I don't know. What, did I make that look harder than it? needed to look you know when you come out of position or something and it looks like no layout. making i think making it look hard making it look worse was if you had come out and made like you didn't make the wrong decision in my opinion i i, I don't think so either i think at the time it, i just was like oh i felt kind of she could have chipped me but i'm also six foot so. oh my god she could not have chipped you um and no yeah. way at that speed yeah, I, it was one of those that i wasn't organizing the weak side i knew that she was coming but it was one of those it was like too late to say yeah yeah, yeah. Like, okay, I don't know if she's going to touch this early or let it roll. Um, but but I, had she, you would have been fine. Right, so that's why I kind of stepped out in that moment. I'm strong, not so much with my hands on the ground going 1v1, but with my feet. I didn't really have a ton of foot saves in the, in the tournament, but in training, I'm something I'm really comfortable with and that I actually I love doing. And part of that is, you know, closing the space and getting set in the right moment, not just yeah. coming through the ball no, you can't anticipate for foot saves or you're going to get it's gonna go through your legs <laughs> or you're going to go wrong foot. Um, so that's why I think I stepped out was, okay, I'm going to get ready for her to just kind of try to dig it past me. Um, also, I had no idea if my, my defender was going to be able to recover in time because she was whipping across. So I just decided to kind of take some space away from her. And I think my balanced position did give me the best opportunity to make a full extension on that because – had I leaned anyway, I, it would have taken too much time. Or had you not been body weight forward, like you were set in your body, you were set 
at the right time so that that reaction could happen. And it was too many times when we talked about this um, with what, the save in the and the, uh, in the um, MLS final, no, not save the goal, um, where he still that ball's being headed. And he was still he was still getting into his set position. Yeah, Gaiese. So, yeah, from, Gaiese. From Orlando, so now there yeah. was there was no way that his reaction he was already behind on the reaction, but right. because you were already set, your your reaction was with power and forward, and it kept that out of the net. That was that's what I see about it. I mean, I think for personally, as myself as a goalkeeper, if I get set late, everything it's not even just like. Like my supposition is usually too wide because I'm trying to stop really quickly. Right. Feet wide. Um, I sit on my butt. It's really hard to get out of an extension. So I find that if I can get into that supposition, even if it seems a little too early for myself, I give myself the best chance to make an extension dive safely. Oh, it's like a, yeah, it's a rhythm. So it's yeah, like, like it's a rhythm. A chain reaction, getting set late. Exactly. Like, throw your hands back. Maybe you jump. Your set position gets wide. You lean over. Like all these things that happen if you decide to set too late. You brought up a really good point in regards to because I think one of the things that was was happening I think Saskia with the with the play with, with Gaiese was the pulse, and because the pulse was so high by the time he was still up when that shot was when the shot was hit. And Bell, I think there was one thing about well, you. Is if that, you look at the way he's setting, like Franz Hook, when we talked to Franz Hook about that, it's a hop 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 hop. And for, I I never set that way. My set was I was always grounded in some way, and my set was a step into a set. It wasn't like, I was never off the ground to set and move. It was a step. So one foot was always on there, a step, lean forward and move. And it was the timing of the ball. If you see when that ball's hit, he still has to land. And then even though it's little, he still has to land and then move and he's already behind the play. And she, I don't, I feel that your timing on that was like, boom, you know, you were, you were, it was good timing. I'm just saying. Look, see, I'm I'm being good. Michael. No, you're being good and you're being positive. And I mean, I'm being look, positive. I, I, I was told I don't. I, I need to be more positive. <laughs> so I'm being positive. You see something? You rip me apart. Oh, I will. We'll talk later. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I will. Trust me. Just give me a ball. Let you know. I'm not getting some. I'm not getting a German goalkeeper coach. All right, so, all right. So here's a goal. No, I'm just kidding. No, what if I just pulled out like some? All right, here's a goal on Bella. So the goals I got scored on, I was like. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, look, I, you got, if you already I mean, know you, what you did wrong, I don't need to tell you. <laughs> my gosh, it was it was baptism by fire for you, though. I mean, coming into that coming into that first match, I mean, it was like North Carolina first match. Okay, here we go. Let's do this. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, I think my my college experience was similar. I was kind of dunked in the deep end that way. Um, well, I mean, I <laughs> uh, <laughs> our the, the junior goalkeeper uh, had transferred or something, and. Yeah, and we were, I remember like 7 0 losses to Stanford, and I was just like, all right, next game. <laughs> we used to it in that way. Um, but yeah, I was, was stoked for it to be North Carolina for my first game, to be completely honest. I think, uh, I think you and Suskia had the same, uh, same college, college experience, experience, apparently. Uh, no. Um, <laughs> we, hey, we I, I've, seen, <laughs> I've probably seen every situation that can ever happen in a game, <laughs> but that's a good thing. We didn't yeah. want to see my freshman year of college. That was truly a baptism by fire. <laughs> Wasn't so um, I didn't win a pro game till like my third year there. So <laughs> wow. All right. On on that note, um, I want to talk about something in regards to the triggers that is, is, is kind of a thing is that a lot of young goalkeepers, they think that triggers are all just physical. And one of the things, Bella, that you've brought up a lot here is tactics and that the movement off the ball is more of a trigger for you necessarily than what the player with the ball is doing. So kind of break, break that down. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of elements to that. Um, I feel like there are almost more triggers off the ball than there are just on the ball. And there's only so much one person on the ball can do or show you. Um, but you know, there's a lot of stuff off the ball or space related. I think that gives you information about where you should be um, positionally when you need to get set. So a big one for, especially in the NWSL that I had to kind of adjust to from college was um, shooting distance. So my depth in relation to the shooter, um, in the NWSL we have so many amazing athletes that are gonna shoot from anywhere accurately with pace. Um, and so changing that kind of trigger was a, 
was a change for me. Um, and just to get more specific, I'd say that, you know, if someone's got a little bit of space just yeah. outside the 18, they're going to shoot it. Or they yeah, could. Um, so dropping onto my, on my goal line a bit and not being <laughs> high up, and not getting roofed was an adjustment for me coming into the, coming into the league. But yes, movement off the ball from other players, um, especially in that last clip with Hatch, I saw her coming and it, clear as day what's going to happen right it's going to be a slip pass it's just going to depend what the quality of that pass looks like for what I do next um yeah it's a movement off the ball from other from other attackers and uh their their depth and their space from you and and then also where your defenders are and what they're doing and what they're showing is going to be yeah. a ton of information I think it's so important because I tell my like young goalkeepers over zoom no, I tell the young goalkeepers when I'm back on the field with them, um, you got to be ready for a shot from anywhere. And obviously at, the, at that age for club, not so much, but I want to ingrain that in them for as they move up and move forward because it's true. You know, you're playing against the best of the best in front of you. If they get a little window, somebody might knock a shot on you. So if you're, if you're assuming they don't have that little daylight and you're like, well, they can't shoot, so I'm going to, um, you know, worry about something, it, you're going to get caught. You know, whether you're going to get chipped, whether you're going to get, you know, you're just going to be a little bit out of position. So once you get into a certain part of the attacking third or the opponent does into the attacking third, you have to look at it. Like I've organized and I always tell my, my players, your organization should be well over by now. Like, and if you're, if you're playing, haven't already started marking up weak side, if they're not following the runner, that should have been talked about way before this yeah. gets into a threatening like distance. Now you're, it's not your job to organize, it's your job to focus on the ball. Yeah, I think it's something that was ingrained in, into me at some, you know, choose your threshold of mm -hmm. when you're going to stop and just focus, deal with it. Yeah. Um, because there's only so much you can try to fix. You should be, like you said, trying to adjust and fix things, give reminders before it's too late. Yeah. Great. Right. If the weak side's open and there's about to be a cross, you shouldn't be checking your shoulder maybe just give a reminder as you're staring at the ball. You should and say, you might say, watch weak side or to whoever right. it is, but you're, take, you're on the ball. ball. Yeah. Understand your threshold. It's not even <laughs> a subjective threshold. I think that there is a hard objective threshold. Yeah. Not organizing. Stop organizing, please stop organizing. <laughs> stop talking. Yeah, that, that was that, That's one that I would say is not person to person. That is an objective. That is like across the board. I'm like, yes. Stop. <laughs> stop talking. It was one of my biggest, one of, one of my biggest mistakes, um, but trying to go in. Then yeah, I'm still organizing. Well, here's, here's, here's what happened is, uh, when I first started trying to play at the professional level and I did not get to the level that you guys did, but I did attempt to try to play at some level of, uh, after college. And, um, I didn't realize how much faster the game was yeah. and that when I was trying to organize back post, <laughs> the gap was open by the time I was trying to organize that the ball was in the back of the net. Mm -hmm. Or there was a being, or there, there was a play to be made on the ball because the, the speed was that fast, and I just realized I was like, oh my gosh, how many? And I, I, I talked to my goalkeeper coach about this. I was like, how many words am I using that are unnecessary? And it, and it, and it made me really, really. And I, when I started coaching, I started understanding how much clear, concise, direct communication is and so it's so got, important. And it's got to be direct. Number one, it's the nine one one theory. Okay, you don't say somebody. You don't say watch weak side or back post, you have to identify a person and do it, else nobody's going to do it, right? So it's a 911 theory that if there's an accident and you say, call 911, nobody's going to call 911 because they think that somebody else did it, right? So if you say, Jen, mark back post, and she doesn't do it, well, now it's her fault. So, and I, I'm serious. So it's like, you know, even if it's a great ball and good run, I told, you know, I sp specifically told you to do it. But I was always that I was the way I kept connected with the game is even if we were in the attacking third, even with the national team, I was still giving cues. Hey, pinch it a little bit, you know, Brandy, this, that, just watch your weak side. So by the time a breakdown happened or something, I'd already like put those chess pieces in. They already knew to do it. I'm always way ahead of the game. And then there comes a time that that's the end of it. You have to focus on the ball. And that, like you said, I agree. There is a certain point in all goalkeeping. It's across the board. It, it, I don't think it's a gray area. Stop talking and focus on the ball. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, that, that, no, that's a really good point, Saskia. And I, I didn't even think about this in regards to this episode here, but Bella, recognizing triggers doesn't necessarily mean about final action and uh, a play on the ball. Recognizing triggers can be in when you organize and how you organize, right? Right. Um, absolutely. If, you're, if your team's in the, in, the, in the attacking third and you're just kind of watching, ball watching, you know, <laughs> essentially acting as a spectator, which, you know, if it's a slow game or whatever, it only takes one counterattack to uh, level you. things. Uh, you can't wait to organize when they're coming at you. That ha- that unfolds so quickly. You're going to be chased. Like, you're going to go to organize something and the situation changes. Change your plan. Like, you're trying to organize ahead of time. Put yourself in the best position to be concise and not chasing the play in terms of organizing. Um, is going to give you the best chance to not be chasing with, you know, chasing the organization when the ball keeps coming, keeps coming, and you mm-hmm. finally have to think that if you can organize early, it, that cutoff becomes more clear right? Yeah. Like you're not, there's not so much that needs to be done because you've organized early and you can, you know, effectively and calmly cut off and just zoom in. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Anybody that's like, if there, let's say there's a counterattack, quick counterattack and anybody that's like, oh my God, Jen, push in. Like you're too late. You're already too late. Like if, you if, have if to you're, skip if ahead. You're, yeah. If you're, if you're, def- if you're outside back was out there like talking to the fans and something and they're like totally out of position, that's your fault too. You know, you're up there watching the balls and they are, are attack, they're attacking third. We're going to goal. And what t- it takes two seconds just to say, hey, make sure you pinch in. Make sure you guys, you know, watch this, watch for counter and stuff like that. So when it happens, you're already in position to, to, to shut it down. But if you're catching up to the play, you're, you're behind. Yeah, and you're I think that goes a lot into um, soccer IQ and, and really learning the game is trying to put yourselves in the mindset of those those are people that are trying to score on you <laughs> and, uh, see what, you know, see what holes there are in front of you and um, trying to plug those holes before they're leaking. Um, it's kind of, so to speak. So yeah, I think that if you're reactively organizing, you're already behind, you need to be proactively organizing and, you know, some reactive things here and there, but it, it can't be mostly reactive. It has to be completely proactive. You have to be, and that's the only time you should be proactive in goalkeeping and, and cheating or, assuming is kind of anticipating what they're going to do next. See how I'm no, I was just going to say, I don't, was be say reactive, like, oh. don't be reactive, be proactive. I see Saskia it is your cheerleader. Did you see I her? wanted to make a t-shirt that said, stop being right. reactive, be proactive. I'm like, seriously. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I made that up. See, it's gotten all the way to Seattle. No, just um, kidding. <laughs> I want to talk about this and I want to bring up that Lynn Williams deflection uh, shot, which was early, early on in that game, because that's another trigger is when a ball is hit and then it takes a deflection, how you recognize that that ball hits on the deflection and how the movement has shifted. So uh, do you guys mind if I play that, that play right here? All right, here we go. A little bit because I don't think this is the most dynamic of my movements. My dog said, yes, (laughs) play it. All right, here we go. Ball comes in. Yeah, well, no, but that's a good recovery save. That I saw your face. You're like, eh. it wasn't the I was like, ew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, but hold on. I kept it out of the net. Play it again. Objective one complete. I kept it out yeah. of the net. Keep the ball out of the net. Um, Look, the gap's open, and you make the recovery because of the way the ball that was being hit, and now you recovered. That's still yeah. a good movement. I'm going to be – I'm devil's advocate. I'm, 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 I'm fine with it. I'm not going to be a stickler. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I will. <laughs> it's your, it's your can, play, can, your play. Can you can I be for however you want. Yeah. yeah. It just didn't look, I mean, I didn't feel very dynamic. I'm glad, it, and it was probably because it was a deflection and I was hectic. I wasn't planning on doing that. I got, I was a little bit under, I didn't fully excite. You can kind of see here that my pushing legs a little bit collapsed. I'm not quite fully extending through it. Um, not the point. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I think that this one, three minutes into the game was great. Um, I was, my positioning was ready for, um a slotted ball behind my back line yeah um as you can see i'm not she's not sh- her body language isn't showing me that she's going to shoot it um but i think if you look oh, here i go but okay just listen i think and i think you know this that's why you're talking about it but i think if you look that pre- your pre stretch you have a really quick set leaning towards the far post and wait look you get the ball in the net and that's all that matters to me too i don't keep it all of that but if we're going to analyze it yeah, yeah i think you knew that really what she was and i think she was looking for the slotted ball in this deflection and and obviously not to commit over commit else that would have been a goal yeah right 
So you were still able to be balanced. I think you're, see that, see that wide step right there? Absolutely. Yep, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yep. I think that if I can be really balanced, that that looks a lot easier. And then the, you might be able to hold it. You know, it, the, the more often that we can make it look clean and easy, the better. And I thought that, you know, I, I, I saved this ball, but I mean, you, I'm, if I'm balanced, that's just a two hand. Thank you. You, so you make, you save the ball, but you made it a harder situation than I could have been. Right. And I think that, you know, my positioning is, is good here. I think that, you know, in the game and certainly looking at, I was like, if she, you know, slots that near post, I think I, I, I got it. Especially if my hips aren't too over rotated, yeah. I can attack it. Um, but I did get that little lean and I had to really fight it. I felt, mm -hmm. it, felt it in the game. It was like, I felt like that leaned ready to go. And as soon as it deflected, it was like, <laughs> right. But the good, but, the good, but I would tell you, you know, even with that, and I, you know, I see how positive I'm being. It's like even in in, in criticism, even in like technically going through something. I'm well, Bella's like positive. Bella's like the perfect goalkeeper for you because she's but like I'm she's o she's positive. open to all of this, and she's harder on herself than you are. <laughs> no, so I think that still, what's great about the save is I think ninety percent of goalkeepers that had that lean in wouldn't have been able to recover. Um, so although that little lean and you felt yourself fighting it, you still have the athleticism and everything to come back and make that save. Yeah. Like I said, at the end of the day. Saved me, what saved me is that my body was out of it in terms of being balanced. My body was guessing, my mind wasn't. Right. That, like, had I, had I committed to the cross, I think I would have been really screwed on that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that, you know, I was able to overcome it because I was more more mentally balanced than I was physically. Your eyes were still on the ball. Um, yeah, find, trying to overcome that mm -hmm. physically was, it felt like I was just barely there in the game and it was like, <laughs> but yeah, it was kind of like, hey, don't, don't anticipate too much was my own feedback in the game. Yeah, and, well, you got you know, and we see the same thing. It was just that little lean and step. Yep. But you still kept the ball in that. So, I mean, like, if I was on the sideline and you'd be, and we discussed it, I'd be like, hey, kept the ball in that. We'll talk about it later. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's all good with me. It's all good with me. I'm like, and, and, you got, and you got your first touch early in the game. There you go. So, yeah. So, but I always say get, that. You know that. And the like, legend like, of Bella Biggs but it begins. Yeah. I so said, we always say that. Like, oh, should they use the top hand? Should they use the backhand? And I was like, they kept the ball in that. <laughs> um, <laughs> three minutes again against our, you know, against North Carolina. It was like, uh, that's not, a huge, but that's also a huge statement. Not a goal. <laughs> but it's also a huge statement because it's a whole entire situation if that ball had gone in. Yeah. Like now you're down, you know, that three minutes in there is that goal. But you, you know, recovering in a goalkeeper mind, like field players might not have noticed that recovering and making that save also sets a standard and a precedence for your team. Like, hey, I'm here. And, you know, you're going to have to really work to get the ball by me. Presence. Oh. We talked about Speak, that. Yes, we did. We did with Dan Abrahams, that, that presence in the body language. Speaking of speaking of body language and reading players' bodies, look at that segue. Did you see how I just did that? I'm so it's proud of myself. It's getting better. It's getting better. It's getting better. Um, Bella, what are some of the mistakes that goalkeepers make when reading a player's body? Um, obviously, at the youth level, I, I see this countless, countless, countless times where goalkeepers read – read the body in a certain way and then just assume that the player is going to move like that. And then they start shifting. So what yeah. are some of the other mistakes you see? I think that the assumption comes from deciding that they're done reading too early. Um, deciding that they've had all, got all the information that they need. And I certainly make this mistake, but when I'm really honed in and really watching through to the very last second, I find that I'm making the right decisions. And when I'm anticipating, it's just, and it's, you know, milliseconds we're talking about when you're deciding to, okay, I've read enough, I'm going to act. It's milliseconds, the difference. If you just hold out a little bit longer, you might find that they're giving you different information than you thought. Um, and my best example of that would be like um, someone that's taught me all the patience in the world with reading triggers is being shot on by Christine Sinclair. Um, she's so deceptive. Um, you know, she'll show you that she waits until you've made that, that tiny little fraction of a second. Um, before she shoots it, she waits to see what you've decided that she's going to do, and she goes the other way. So you really have to hold out until the the very last second, um, and you'll find that you're you're more successful because your your brain's going to read. I think the more reps you see, you got to trust yourself to make the right decision and not 
anticipate too quickly, if that makes sense. That's my problem with triggers, at least, is that if I'm in, like, a, if we're doing foot saves, and I may be just getting there a little bit early with my, with my foot, or I'll go completely the wrong foot, it's because I'm not reading the situation long enough. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm feeling rushed. I'm feeling, like, panicked, maybe, and I'm feeling like I don't have the time to hold out just a little bit longer, and it turns out I do. I'm quick enough, and I'm strong mm -hmm. enough that if I just hold out, I can get there. And that's a good point and something I talked about the other day was because you because you have to hold out and assess a situation is where the quickness and the explosiveness comes in. That's where you make up for that millisecond of, of holding. Um, you make up with your strength and your speed. So when you make the decision, it's, it's explosive and it's here and it's there. But if you don't have that explosion, plus you wait, then you're going to be behind the ball. And like Michelle said, when we had Acres on, you know, for Sinclair, um, you know, she is waiting, you know, Mia waits as well. Like she is waiting to see you bite and UCLA, man, not Mia hands us too. But, um, <laughs> but when you don't give that to her, then now she is in her head. And Michelle admitted that. I mean, it's the greatest song. No, it's yeah. Michelle Akers. She admitted that. She goes, I'm hoping you, you're going to bite. I'm hoping I get you to do that. I'm hoping you're falsely reading my body language. And when you don't, now I'm like, shit, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so that's what we want. But again, because you have to hold and wait to um, Tony and Chico, leave later, I have early power, power through. So it's taking that split second to make that, but you have to be able to make up for that with, with, with quickness and yeah. power. And I think that's where we see a lag with, with youth goalkeepers is that um, they do hold that space a little bit and try to read the triggers. That quickness and strength and explosiveness doesn't come overnight. So even exactly. if they see it correctly and they're not quite getting there quick enough, they think that <laughs> something's wrong. Um, when they're, you know, they're anticipating or they're reading the situation correctly and it's just, there's a lag physically and they give up and start guessing. That's kind of like what I see. Um, oh, what a good point. There's a lot. And it's like, if you can just keep doing the right things in terms of reading the game, the physical side will catch up if you're doing right. Yeah, it's athletically that you're, it's not up here. Yeah. And I, I found that, I found that out the hard way in, in college. <laughs> like I was athletic enough, big enough, quick enough, explosive enough to just react to, to shots. The, right. the pace wasn't so high that, you know, I could save a lot of balls by being in the right position and reacting to the path, the flight of the ball. Right. I get to the NWSL and it's like, that doesn't fly anymore. Uh -uh. <laughs> you do no. that and you wait, the ball's in the back of the net by the time Absolutely. you're off. Like, <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, you're like, and like, I, what's going on. And so it, it, that, that adjustment period for me happened Absolutely. two and a half years ago. But um, yeah, I think anytime you go up in a level, whether you're, you know, very young or you're my age, anytime you go up in a level, it's that reading comes, becomes more and more important because these balls are perfectly placed and very deceptively taken. And so you can't guess. You can't. You might get lucky, like you said, maybe one in 10 times, but. You, you no, know I mean, well, I can even dumb it down to our conversation with Franz Hook about, you know, our, our tutorial by Franz Hook. We all just sat here like this. because The two-hour two two hour tutorial. The two-hour two we just sat here and he just like schooled us and he like <laughs> everything. But, you know, being on that same page, and even if you break it down even simpler for young goalkeepers watching and stuff like, like take PKs, for example. You know, don't guess. I'm sorry. Force, force in my opinion, and Franz Hook's opinion, force the forward to hit a perfect shot you know you know if you can get if you can get your timing right on your set so it's the boom and you can react you can react to the shot you're forcing that player to shoot a perfect pk because i trust that at your level um you're gonna get a couple of those you know as opposed to like we saw in the end of in the mls game how many times he went right every single time? What was it? I mean, I was just like four, three or four times. Yeah, it was. He was driving me crazy. I was like, "What? Did you just pick that you're just gonna go right the whole time and hopefully catch a ball?" Like that was, I think, the situation. Like I was like wanting to beat my head against the wall because a couple of the shots went right down the middle. So if you take that quick pause, yeah, yeah, if, if you take, yeah, and and then some of them were just in his bubble, but he's diving all the way over here because he's assuming, and it, it goes for the same on the field in the run of play, but. That's where athleticism comes in and your power and your strength, and it's got to be worked on. And I totally agree with you on that. And if I had to give advice to 
you know, coaches and players that want to get more of that reading that last second snapshot of body language for like a one-on-one -on -one shot or like PK or whatever and ignoring other cues. In, in our goalkeeper group, I can't tell you how much of our, you know, um, reps that we receive are with our head down and we pick it up and she's already striking the ball. Yeah. Already. Or, you know, we're having to have our body position and turn into it and we have no, you know, it's that last second snapshot. And so I can paraphrase AD French, who <laughs> jokes that that has helped her with PKs because all you need is that last snapshot right before yep. the ball. Yep. And if you're focused on all this other stuff and worrying about guessing this and that, PKs have become more enjoyable for her because again, I love them. that, you know, we do so much stuff where we are on the goal line, we have our head down, and she uses a cue word and we, we are picking our head up. It's either coming, the balls either are coming at our face or at our feet mm -hmm. or it's going left or it's going right. And we have half a second to read her body language. And to, and to, to react. Up, just be the last second. And that has helped so much. We do that every day. Something yeah. where our vision is obstruction. We've got glasses, like all these things that you can do. Oh, <laughs> well, you have those fancy glasses with the, th the things, with the things like this? Yeah. knockout. Yeah. In stroke. Oh, I haven't been that one. But uh, yeah. yeah, she likes her toys. Um, but I do that. I, bet, I don't know if it's, you know, I guess it I'm comes as you need glasses. It comes as simple as striking. I do that with my kids a lot. And it's second, head up, head down. And it's, it's, closed, it's that up. quick. And the yeah. number one thing is find the ball. Mm -hmm. Your eyes, find the ball. Find the ball. Yeah. That's eyes to the ball. Mean, eyes to the ball. Pro level is those reps of uh -huh. that helped me transition into reading and again, just finding the ball. Just save the ball. Find the ball. And I tell my kids that all the time when I do stuff where you're facing this way. And, you know, even if it's like a slotted ball, you're turning. What's the first thing you do? Your head goes. Nothing. Your head to body will follow, but find the ball. Find the, find the ball. Because <laughs> like, if you're going like this, by the time your body, if you're like stuck Canning. with your head, by the yeah. time you turn, the ball's in the back of the head. Right. But if you turn your head, which you can turn quicker than your body, if you turn your head and find the ball, your body will follow. I'm giving you the tools, you know, as yeah, second. Cool. This is what it's going to follow. Like, you've got all these triggers. It doesn't matter if you, if you don't do the correct things to A, find the trigger and B, respond to the trigger. The triggers yeah. don't mean anything if you don't have those tools. Speaking of that, Bella, um, I, I want to share one more clip if everyone's cool with that. Okay. Yeah. I want to share one more clip. Okay. So this is... This is again Lynn Williams, and uh, this is—I think you might remember this one. This was at the near post. Hold on, let me open it up right here. Um, and I want you—I want basically everyone to see kind of how your starting position kind of directly related to what you were seeing in front of you right here. Let me let me open it up right there. And I think I know. Okay. <laughs> There was a Can lot of Lynn Williams stuff that game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was a lot. Okay, <laughs> right? so I, I, all right. So no, she was having a game. I remember. Okay, so wait, wait, hold on. Is this? Am I going on the photo? Oh, no, that's, that's that one. Okay. All right, so here, I'll play it from here. Yada, yada, yada. Okay, so I think this is the one right here. So, positioned. Shot right there. So positioned right there. Call, you have to change programs. Like, change. that's what we say with our group. You have to change programs. I had to do it three different times. Mm -hmm. And those are three to three separate triggers. But your your eyes. So here's the first one. Your head, if you watch her like head. Up, right there. Doesn't have a lot of options. She's got defender pressure, and she's near the goal line. So I square up because that's what I've been taught to do. Yep. Yeah. It slides through, but I have to turn to see if maybe there's pressure. Set. Set. Back. Turn. Set. Look Set. at the patience, though. I, I want a lot of young goalkeepers to see that. Look at the patience. She didn't. You didn't panic in this situation. And you held, and then it's a simple just touch. Good, good position. Simple shape behind the ball. Just keep it out. Good position. Boom, yeah. just like that. Yeah. But again, so. I find, I don't know if you agree with this, but I find that the more in tune you are um, up here, so the more your, your eyes are following the ball, the more in tune you are there, things are slower. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not chaotic. It's not reactive. Right. Like, it's, ah. it's, it's chaotic when you're like this, but when you're like this, it, it, it looks fast to us, like to the layman. Um, not that close, but to the layman. But it but if you're to, if you're dialed in here and with your eyes and everything like that, it, it's not going as crazy and as fast as you think it is. Right. And it's because of I mean, in that moment I'm trying to pick in only the important information and the, you know, in the first ball, it's like, all right, I'm gonna square up so she has very little. Right. 
to, to see. Slides through anyway. Okay, there could be change program. There could be someone coming. I need to step and get squared up. Oh, no, okay, it's sliding back across, get set for a shot. Oops, right. like you just, every time there's a new trigger, yep. you have to readjust and just take in the information that you need to take in and all this extra stuff. Like, I don't know if you saw my defenders, they were all over the place, <laughs> like side to side, maybe they were gonna get it, maybe it'd go through their leg. Like, right. just taking in the information that I need, which is what Lynn Williams has in terms of options, where those options are. But I think the other thing, if you notice, Michael, when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago, is the adjustments are so small. Yeah. Okay. They're not major steps. They're not like, oh, here goes the ball. You're not following. You're, you're just changing your adjust. You're changing your position a little bit. Okay. So it's a little bit. It's not like, you know, you have kids and they get stuck with, I think a lot of things is they get stuck with following the ball too far or they get stuck with, uh, you know, somebody running through them. Like you got to like the blinders on, you have to like kind of zone in and then it's just simple turns and adjustments. That's why it didn't look so chaotic because you, you had your positioning, you were, you know, so you were square, which I do too. You were square, came across. It was a short, it was a short adjustment with your legs, with your feet, body weight forward. Okay. Short adjustment again, okay. So if you watch, you didn't have to travel very far, which is short adjustments. Yeah, and if you want to see a bad example of me, <laughs> it was the tying goal for the spirit. And it was because I was closing the near post. I don't know if you guys remember it. It was that flick from uh, Sanchez and then a header. I came Oh my gosh. Play. Well, that, 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 all, that play was Crazy. pretty ridiculous. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I wasn't anticipating yeah. it. So I, I got scrambled mentally, which, you know, you want to stay as calm as possible. And I got scrambled because I wasn't expecting this back heel flick thing that she did that was crazy. <laughs> Did she but do that at practice at UCLA? I did a really bad job of getting set in the right moment. I, I wasn't really with I am okay. trying to like catch up, like catch up. So I just, I am sprinting across goal and I don't get set in the right moment. Ball's coming off her head. I'm still moving and I'm over. I, like you said, I just overrun and it goes right back the way right. it came. So that's, if you want to see a bad example, like that is one where I just got <laughs> frazzled and yeah, just you have all Paul butt to the back post and ended up just going back with and, and I say this to players a lot. I would have just caught it. Yeah, and I say to players a lot, and this is a to another Tony DeChico statement, but it's better to be setting out of position than moving. Right. So you get you get you get into drills and you get into things where you're like, okay, so you're gonna start at that post and you're gonna come, we're gonna do near post shots or something like that. And here, timing wise, you know, I might be shooting when you're halfway into the center of the goal. You're thinking, I gotta get to the near post. Yeah. Instead of looking at at the fact I'm shooting the ball already. So don't keep trying to get to the near post. Set and then trust that you can either cover that near post for even if you're out of position set or if it goes back the other way, you're there. But if you're still running to the near post and I'm shooting the ball, you know, you might, if I shoot it near post, you might make a save. But if I don't, then here, go, here yeah, you go. Here you go. The concept is a communication. There's a point of no return where it's like, yeah, I had a plan A. <laughs> but I need to read that this person's about to shoot it. And I had plan A. I can't, I can't accomplish plan A. I'm going to give myself the best chance. Thank you. Absolutely. You know I mean? It's like, maybe you want to be fixing the back post, but it, there's no time. You got to just deal with you gotta it. You got to just get set and, and deal with it. Read that they're going to shoot it. You're not where you want to be. Plan B, get set. Like, yeah. it's the same thing. It's better to be set and out of position than moving. By, by the way, I, I absolutely love the change program thing. Like that is, is that an Nadine thing? Cause that, that is, that is awesome. Yeah, that's, that's that. Yeah. I hear that daily. It's like change, <laughs> change programs. She does those change programs. Um, it's when something like, you know, it's when something unexpected happens, which happens all the time. Deflections, you know, maybe something you didn't see your defense. It goes through someone's legs. Changing programs is like the fundamental of, you know, just being flexible and not getting frazzled. Um, yeah. and just, yeah, not over adjusting, just being calm, that kind of stuff. Is I think, oh, to answer your question about Ashley, I didn't get to spend a lot of time with her, obviously. Um, I think she's one of those players that Sanchez is that, like, she'll catch you off. Like, you know, I mean, you're not, ex yeah, yeah, so yeah, you're not expecting her to do what she does. Hat, it was outside of her foot in stride. It yeah. wasn't easy to read. It's like, and, and she's kind of, like, goal, it would have been like, whoa, like, she's, yeah. Getting a through ball. Like, and she's like, like stealth about it. You're like, oh, you know, here comes a little ball on Sanchez right up to the end. And then next thing you know, like, <laughs> like what? You yeah. know, and I think, you know, that she's definitely one of those people that it's good for a goalkeeper to train against and understand, like, you know. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
so uh, Bella, how are you doing on time? We're, we're going to start wrapping up right now. So. Great. Yeah, I've You're got good? all time. Yeah, okay. I'm, on my, I'm on my last little. You're on your, la you're on yeah, your last little. I got to get my CEPA call. You were so funny. Yeah, like, I love the call. I'm like, I, I take it with a nurse. I have everything. <laughs> <laughs> I take SEPA call before every uh, podcast. I do. Nice. Yeah, to try to keep my voice uh, going. It sounds like an ad read, by the way, the way I just said that. I'm like, speaking of that promo code I18 for SEPA call. Um, no. No, we're not going to do that. Um, Bella, uh, before we go, um, is there any advice that you would give like kind of like young goalkeepers um, to kind of be patient and wait for that final snapshot um, rather than, because I think, and this, this is something that even older goalkeepers, myself, for instance, I think I'm two steps behind. I read the snapshot, I think a half a second too early. And then by then it's, it's too late a lot of times. Um, so kind of like what, what have you noticed that has worked for you in the past? I mean, it sounds just like very vague, but being patient. Um, I think that just having that understanding that if you're reading it too early, it's going to affect the outcome of the play and it's going to affect your decision making. Um, so it's hard to it's hard to tell young kids to be patient, um, especially with, with what we talked about with that lag and in, in quickness and explosiveness to actually complete the play um, well. But yeah, I think that for me, like as a kid, if I'm putting myself in a kid's shoes, like sometimes it's easy to just get into shooting practice and not be really reading triggers at all um, and just be reacting to shots. So I think first step would be trying to read triggers, like something basic like hip position or depth, stuff like that. Um, and then waiting as long as possible because those technical, those athletic aspects are going to come. So if you can manage to stay patient as long as possible, um, and you'll know, right? Like if you're thinking in your head, like if you wait and you're like, she's going left and it goes right, you know, you were wrong. You may not realize if you're guessing and it goes the right way, you might think it may be a false, false positive, but for the most part, you're going to know, um, if you just stand there and don't react, if you're just standing there, not in goal and you're just watching it and you start trying to like read it and you say left or right, you're going to start getting a good idea of how successful you are at that. So taking out the, the athletic side of it, um, you know, that, that the technical aspect needs to come first and then the athletics will, will catch up. You can't, it's harder to do it the other way around. <laughs> I think. Yes. No, ab absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Tuscan, anything you want to add to that or is that pretty, pretty much sums it up? How's that? Sorry, my dog was making a strange noise. No, um, <laughs> uh, absolutely. Positive thoughts here. Absolutely on the same page. Um, I love it. And um, I think that this is like one of those sessions, one of those um, podcasts and stuff that there's so much to learn from this. And I deal with this, you know, especially with my younger kids, like whether I have a really athletic goalkeeper that thinks they can rely on their athleticism for the rest of your career, which you can't, you know, and we brought that up as opposed to um, goalkeepers that aren't as athletic. So let's see how we can think and be, you know, what, what you know, you have to, start using your head as a goalkeeper you're not a cone back there just right. back there to make the same shots it's not it's not situation you yeah. know um especially as you move period it's not situation so um you know yeah i don't think coaches and, and young players realize how much information is available in front of them and is available at their disposal to give them the best chance of saving the ball yeah. goalkeeping doesn't start when the shot comes off the foot exactly um which i think is not something that a lot of people or coaches consider in terms of the depth of their training and what they're coaching their kids. Um, I think that most, most school coaches, like the young kids are like, Oh, well, just come up more. Or, oh, drop back. And they don't understand. Yeah, like, this. Okay. It's like, yeah, there's so, yeah. but what are they communicating? And is your defense on the same page? And what is the means to the end of the communication, you know, and why are you telling them to do this? And why are you organizing? There, there's so much more to it. You're not just this like, little reactive wall back there, little Bobby, such a jumping bean, he's going to make all the saves. It, you know, it doesn't yeah. work that way forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think that, like, you're, if you're going to work on extension dives every day of the week, oh my God. it's going to result in, like, marginal gains. You're going to get stronger, right? It's going to, but we're talking marginal gains in terms so of... So what's that happen, like, once a season? Much further to the post, being able to get that much further out of a push versus, deal, you know, getting better at the things that come before that that make your job a lot easier. Thank you. Um, not as, not as 
cool. It's not as no, exactly. I don't like. I don't care. Like I've well, told you, I want as little to do as possible. Like exactly. I told my keepers, I'm just like you're gonna look at this. Your parents are gonna sit on the sideline in their little folding chairs and see little Bobby dive to the upper corner, and I'm gonna look at you and be like, nice save. All you have to do is take a step to the right. And you yeah, can you you stand on your feet. Organize that earlier. Like there are so many steps up the ladder to prevent that highlight real save. And a few times in your career, you will truly have to make some wild saves. But I can't tell you how many times, like, you know, my team, we always joke, like the field players and, and, and field player coaches are like, oh, great. Oh, my God, right? And all the goalkeepers are like, can you just maybe get in set earlier? <laughs> <laughs> like, oh my God, so true. Like, I'll sit there like, oh, what a great day. But I'm just and like, we go, no. <laughs> and I'm like, um, oh. Daniel, next time take a step to the right and just catch the ball, please. Yeah. Oh, exactly. oh there's, the, the, you, what, know? you know, the, the, you know what's worse though? The worst is like uh, when, when you were younger, you were at Showcase and like the college coaches are all walking around with their little folding chairs and things like that. And like goalkeepers are clearly embellishing to try to get the go go coaches with their folding chairs it's to so sit down obvious, and though. watch them. It's so obvious. I'm like, you could have just, just held, very, like held that. Yeah. yeah. It's you just ridiculous. made a very simple situation, very difficult. And now it's a corner kick. Triple save. I'm like, oh, wow. <laughs> like if you hold it the first time, you don't have to make the triple save. <laughs> yeah. Very, very true. I mean, um, <laughs> well, well, Bella, I'm awesome, awesome having you on. I re really appreciate you taking the time. I mean, we've gone over an hour right here. Um, Saskia's been positive the entire time. It's been a phenomenal show oh, like that. It was you're, after you're... we had our, our, you know, sports psychologist. <laughs> On um, if uh, if anybody out there uh, wants to follow you, uh, your social media has been blowing up since the Challenge Cup and all that. Where's uh, where's the best place for people to reach out to you? I'm on Twitter and Instagram. Um, Bella Bixby thirty one on Instagram and Bella Geist on Twitter. So yeah, give me a follow if you care about what I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> nice one, pitch. That's a better pitch than yours, man. Then, yeah, well, and, and you can follow Saskia Weber on all pl platforms as well, too, at Saskia underscore Weber. Uh, guys, remember, contact at Inside the 18. That's the number 18media.com for a guest suggestion or a topic suggestion. Uh, shout out to all the people that said uh, we need to have Bella Bigsby on. We were already oh, on top of that. Sweet. Since uh, No, it's true. I mean, people, uh, you, you, made a, you made quite a number. Uh, on, on a lot of goalkeepers you're very honestly is very inspiring Bella to be honest with you uh, a lot of young goalkeepers you know uh, who are in situations where um, they might be not regularly playing um, you know sh seeing a situation like yourself where yeah, you grabbed your opportunity uh, you know was, is very inspiring to a lot of those kids but that takes a certain uh, amount of character to be able to do that and yeah. you know that's what that's what coaches look for if you're I mean, not yeah, if you I mean, take I mean, advantage of your opportunity right and you can stand up at that time that's incredible it's awesome yeah I think that my advice would be um you know it's hard as a goalkeeper you don't get subbed in and out with field players and just train to be ready at every available opportunity that's not always going to be a linear growth some days you have good days some days you have bad days it took me two and a half years to get a get my start and I haven't played a you know really really ultra competitive environment in a game for that amount of time so definitely wasn't a linear path to get there um, like I said, good days, some really bad days. Just stick with it because yeah. you know when you're getting your opportunity. Well, I, I will tell you this. Your, your Wikipedia page is growing exponentially. It's, I uh, looked at it. Wow. <laughs> I wouldn't even consider it. What are you, the stalker? <laughs> I have to just read it. You got to do it. Mike, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> Oh, oh my gosh, guys! At Goalkeeper Podcast, if you wanna, you want, you wanna hear more uh, information on people's Wikipedia's, I guess. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> if you, if a guest suggestion or topic suggestion, or if you wanted to reach out to us and ask any questions, that's all the time on Inside the Eighteen today, guys. And we are out later. Yeah!